So for the last two weeks, we, we've been unpacking this big idea that everybody's been invited to draw near to God. That in fact, we are invited into a relationship with God. And there's only one path to the Father, and that path is through his son, Jesus. And even though that we all get on the path the same way, that while we're on that path, there will be different expressions or styles of how to draw near to God. And we took, uh, we took some information from a book, Sacred Pathways, by Gary Thomas. And, and though there isn't, these aren't really nine biblical things about how to draw near to God, but these are nine things that Gary observed, nine different ways people tend to draw near to God. And then in week one, we gave you the book and an assessment to help you figure out what your style is so that you can start learning and what works best and what doesn't work for you so that you can have a better understanding on how you personally can draw near to God, right? And we did that. So, and then we also said that there was, there was like commonalities between or common practices that you can find between all these different styles. And we picked three, I picked three that I felt were key practices and common to all of us. And last week we talked about what? The Bible, right? The Bible. And how as you read through the New Testament, you read over and over and over again the importance of letting the Bible dwell in you richly, right? You remember the analogy, dry sponge versus soaking wet sponge? What happens when you get squeezed, right? So letting the, world, the word dwell in you richly. If you missed any of those the first week or the second week, because we're at the back end of this, this series, mynewday.church, mynewday.church, or our Facebook page. We've been posting them there too now. Um, you can go back and you can watch those. They're there for your enjoyment as long as the internet doesn't come crashing down on us, right? So today, today's common practice that we're going to talk about shouldn't be a surprise to any of us. Today, we're going to talk about this, prayer. So last week, I challenged everybody to start bringing their Bible, right? Did anybody live up to the challenge? Yeah, amen, I got mine with me, right? No big deal if you don't. We're going to put the slides up there. Um, if you would, turn with me to page 1260. If you have my Bible, it's 1260. I don't know what it is in yours, okay? But you can go ahead and open your book, open to the, the, the book of Matthew. That's where we're going to be at today, the book of Matthew, chapter 6. You can go ahead and get there while I'm talking. Um, because we would love to be able to teach you guys how to navigate and learn. Like, pa Pastor Chris Hodgins says, tells this story about this, this girl that walked up to him and asked him, hey, what's the dot dot? Like, that was this girl's serious her question. Like, what's the dot dot? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like, Matthew 6, dot, dot, 7. Like, what's the dot, dot? And there might be some of you that are here watching online that, that, that don't know what the dot, dot is. And that's okay. We'd love to help you learn that, right? Anyways, looking at the, we're going to be looking at a Matthew, out of, Pat, out of Matthew, a passage out of Matthew. There we go. That's the way you say that. Um, I need to slow down. All right. Matthew was one of the original 12 followers of Jesus. In fact, I would guess that it took most of the other disciples that walked with Jesus some time to actually accept Matthew because Matthew was a tax collector. Tax collectors were Jewish people who would take the taxes from the Jewish people and then give the taxes to Rome what was owed to Rome. Now, the tax collectors typically didn't just collect what was needed to pay Rome. They would add this or add that and, they, that, and that's how they would make their money. So they were hated among their own people. So you can see how it would have been hard for some, some of the Jewish disciples to come around and, and start living with this idea of traveling with and living with Matthew, right? Anyways, Matthew, after the resurrection, wrote down his account of the life of Jesus, and we so cleverly called it the book of Matthew, okay? That's, we're cool like that. That's what we did, really original, okay? Anyways, today, we're going to ask this question. We're going to ask this question right here. What does Jesus say about prayer? What does Jesus say about prayer? So today we're going to look at a place where Jesus is talking to a group of people, like some of us, a, a group of people that have fallen into a lot of bad habits and bad mentalities and thought process when it comes to prayer. Like some of us, they, they had prayers that they had memorized and would say over and over and over again. Or maybe they would pray really, 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 really long prayers, or that they, they were just people that didn't pray because they didn't know how to pray. I mean, come on. The 12 disciples one day walked up to Jesus and says, hey, you do that differently than us. Teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray. And we thought, 
because we thought we knew how to, but after watching you, Jesus, after watching you, Lord, we're missing something. And the truth is, there's some of you in here that don't pray because you don't know how to pray. Or you've learned how to pray in someone else's style. So as we look at this passage, we're going to ask this question, right? We're going to ask this question. How, what does Jesus say about prayer? And we're going to look into a passage uh, knowing that through, through prayer is a, a common practice for all of us. Even though whatever style you are, it's a common practice for us all. But it will and can be expressed differently depending on how God has created and wired you, whatever your style is. Because God, again, another big point we've been trying to make, God has created us all different. Right? Thank God. Like, uh, there's a post that Lucinda posted on Facebook. Or no, it was Cameron that posted it on Facebook about how she loves lists. And reading it just exhausted me. Like, just, uh, like I hate lists, and my boss wants me to make it. Again, it's just, okay, we're all wired differently. Like, I'm not a list person, okay? Another story. Anyways, so we're going to pick it up in Matthew chapter 6, dot, dot, verse 5, okay? That's what the dot, dot is, okay? Verse 5. It separates chapter and verse. If you were curious, if you didn't know, that's what it is. And it starts off like this. When you pray. When you pray. The first thing I want you to see is that Jesus expects you to pray. When you pray. Jesus didn't start off with, if you pray, or perhaps you can pray. No, no, no. He started off with, when you pray. So it's not whether or not you're comfortable with it, or if you feel you're doing it right, or if you have the right words. It is when you pray. And we've all been invited into this. As followers of Jesus, we get tempted to say, praying is just talking to God. And that's part of it. But but by the end of this passage, Jesus, we're very, very narrowly defined what prayer is. By the end of this passage, Jesus gives us what many of us consider to be the model prayer, which is what? The Lord's Prayer, right? Jesus starts off, but before he gets there, Jesus starts off with what? When you pray. So let's be honest. There's more to prayer than just talking to God. Because if that was true, if that wasn't true, there there are people that would that you talk to, that I talk to all the time, that you just don't want to draw near to, right? Let's be real. There's people in your life that you have to talk to all the time that you don't want to draw near to, right? And I would say that there are people, for some of you, that you talk to all the time that you actually want to pull away from. You see what I'm saying? Prayer is so much more than just talking to God. It's about drawing near to God. Right? And the next thing that I want to point out to you is that Jesus tells us that we are to pray in private. Jesus tells us that we are to pray in private. We're going to pick it up right there. It says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. That is all the reward they will ever get. So let me ask you a question. What is their reward? What is the reward? According to this verse, for the person who loves to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them, what is their reward? Recognition. Public recognition. What Jesus is saying is that for those who love to stand on the corner and show how well they can pray and how big their words are and how, how they can work into prayer everything in their life, that, 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 and the people are just going, wow. Listen to that prayer. Listen to those big four-syllable words. God, I wish I was that godly. Oh, that guy must be super close to God. And at the end of the day, they've already received their reward. And that reward was public recognition. And then Jesus gives us this beautiful contrast. And I just, I love this contrast, right? But he says this. He said, Jesus continues. He says, but when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to, the, pray to your father in private. Then your father, who sees everything, will reward you. And when, when I was preparing for this message, I had one of those 
I had a, a revelational moment. I had one of those, my, my contemplative moments where I just learned something new about God and it just set me, just set me on fire for this message, okay? Because I love being rude with you guys. Can I tell you that there are times when I pray that I don't feel like anybody's listening? Like when I finish, it's just quiet and I wonder, does, does anyone hear me? Does anyone else ever feel like that? Am I the only one? Okay, that's it. There's two of us. Great. <laughs> like, like, God, I need clarity. I need to understand. I don't understand what's going on. What's next? Chip, 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 chip. Crickets. Or so it seems. Now, let me show you something that gave me, like I said, just gave me this amazing moment. And I, I sat here for like a, a day. I couldn't even get past this point in the message for like a day, okay? Look at this promise from Jesus. We're going to look at it in a different version. Same verse, NIV version, not the new, uh, new uh, NLT version. So it says this. But when you pray, go into your room. Close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then the father who sees what you've done in secret will reward you. Now, I don't know about you. I've read this passage a bunch. Many times, many times. But what was real to me, revealed to me, and what, what just hit me was this. The unseen father sees you. That, that when you go into that private place and you pray, because we are called to pray when you pray, that God that created everything in the world sees you. What? Yeah, 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 God sees you. Like he's looking at you, sees you. Now I don't know about you, but just thinking about that point makes me more confident when I go into that private place of prayer. Like my, my, my anxiety goes from like 80% down to like nothing. Because even if I don't feel like someone is listening, Jesus just said that the father sees me. And women, you guys like this thing. If you're not looking, you're not listening, right? So if the father sees me, he's looking at me, guess what? He's listening. Because Jesus never said he sees you when you say the right things. He sees you when you pray for a long enough time. He sees you when, when you got exactly the right thing that is written, right? No, 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 Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said that when you go to the unseen place to pray to the unseen Father with words that no one else is ever going to hear, the Father sees you. Who sees what is done in secret and will reward you. So what's the reward? What's the reward? I don't know. Jesus doesn't tell us. <laughs> but can I tell you what I think? Because the person that prays in public for all to see gets their reward of public recognition. And I think the contrast that Jesus is trying to make is that the reward for the person who prays in the unseen places with the words that no one else will hear to the unseen father, Jesus don't, doesn't tell us what that reward is, but these are my thoughts. It's the same as the person who prays in public. That you get public recognition, that, but it's not from people. You're not getting public recognition from people. You're getting public recognition from your heavenly father. Now here's what I'm talking about. If, if you've been here long enough, you've heard us talk about pray first. Pray first, pray first. We actually did a whole series back in January, pray first. If you missed it, go watch it. Fantastic. We have books outside available here, pray first books, okay, to help you learn these different formulas and styles, even though I really don't think that it all fits. But anyways, that's another story. Now, what I have noticed is that when I do this, when I lean into pray first and I wake up, it seems that throughout my day I have a bit more patience. I have a bit more grace. I have a bit more forgiveness. I have a bit more love. I have a bit more you know, humbleness. 
But when I typically, what, what I typically realize at some point in the day, on those days that I don't pray first, when I don't give God the, un, the unseen father, the unseen time and place, I find myself wrestling with myself to be patient, to be forgiving, to be full of grace and truth, to love like Jesus. And I see it in myself over and over and over again. What I see is that there's something that happens publicly in my life when I start my day off with giving it to the unseen father. The first of your day in the unseen place. And I don't know if that's what Jesus is talking about. He doesn't tell us what the reward is. But I know that there's a connection here. And I don't know what, it, what I see and experience the time and time. Like that's what I see all over. And real quick, by a show of hands, if you want to, would there be anybody else this morning that would say, yeah, John, I understand exactly what you're talking about. That when I start off my day with the unseen father in those unseen places, I, I just, I see a difference in my day. Look at that. I'm not the only one. So I believe with all my heart that there's this connection between private time with your father and your public life out in the world, right? And the next point that Jesus makes as we continue is that it's not about your rhetoric, which is a really fun word to say, okay? It's not all about your words that you speak to get God's attention, but it's more about the condition of your heart, that God is moved by our humility not our rhetoric. Picking it up in verse 7, it says this. When you pray, don't babble on. Don't babble on and on and on as the people of other religions do. In my, in my Bible, it actually says Gentiles, but that's okay. Other religions, some versions say the pagans, okay? They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again and again and again. Don't be like them. Now, Jesus is saying that there, there's another group of people, and that group of people thinks that the way you get God's attention when you pray is to use a whole lot of words and to pray a whole lot of time. Like, God doesn't hear your prayer for those 30 seconds prayers. The, and that those one-minute, two-minute prayers, no, mm, that, that they, they thought that by what they thought was that God started getting, you started getting God's attention when you hit like, like 30 minutes mark, and God would be like, ooh, look at there. Like if you prayed for an hour, you had God's undivided attention. And if you prayed through the night, God was chomping at the bit to give you what you wanted. Like that was their mentality. Like Jesus was saying that there's this mentality among his audience, and I think in some ways it's bled over to ours, that the words we, you, you use, the formulas you use, the length of your prayer, the number of times you repeat what you're saying, that that somehow weighs heavy in with God. That somehow that gets God's attention. And Jesus is like, not so. That God is not moved by the number of your words or the choice of your words or the length of your prayers. By, by the re re repetition of the words or your request. None of that matters. He tells us why here in a minute, and I believe... Uh, but before I get to that, I want to say this. I want to say this. Out of everything so far, I wish that this point would sink in because there are so many of you who are so intimidated to pray because you grew up in a house with a parent or with a mentor in your life that could pray like no one else. Or you watched Pastor Justin get up here or me pray, and, and you know a few prayers. You know the Lord's Prayer, and God, let us thank him for our food. Like, you know a few prayers. But, you, and you get, but once you get off that familiar ground of what you know, and you don't know what to say, and you feel like you can't pray any longer, because you just feel like you're not doing it right. Well, here's the great news. Your heavenly father has invited you into a relationship. And in a relationship, guess what? There's no formulas. There's no memorized lines, except for maybe I love you. If you don't know that one, learn it. Another good one is I'm sorry. Men. Men. <laughs> right? There are no cues. In a relationship, it's about conversation. It's about where I am, the way I am, the real in your face raw me. 
so that Jesus, so Jesus is like the person who thinks they're going to get God, to get to God because they pray longer or they have the right words or they repeat it over and over again. As if that moves God into action, Jesus is like, none, no, it's not that way because it's a relationship. None of that matters. Do you don't move the heart of God by your rhetoric. You move the heart of God by humility and with sincerity. Because you choose to come to him at all. You know that? That's your choosing to come to the God who created all the world. And you have to make that choice. It's a choice. That is, that's what moves and impresses the heart of God. Not the memorization and not the motions and the look at me stuff. Jesus has invited us to pray. So we pray in private, and then we pray, you know, and it's that humility, not the rhetoric that matters. And Jesus is about to pop all of our bubbles with this next statement, that even though we all know this, it doesn't seem to click. And I hope upon hope that it clicks today, that, that we bring something, that, that God brings something new to you and you understand this. And Jesus says the reason why repeating yourself over and over again, the words don't matter. The reason you don't need to worry about all that, he says this, verse eight, he says, don't be like them for your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Like that makes me super motivated to want to pray. He already knows. Jesus is like, God's not taking notes. He already knew. In fact, it's worse than that. God already knew what, he was gonna, what you were going to ask for, and he already decided whether or not he was going to say yes, no, or not yet. God's like already decided if he's going to say no. Like God's like, go ahead, ask me. Thanks. No. <laughs> Motivating. And for some of you, that bothers you. In fact, at some point, it made you angry. Because let's be real, Aren't you, you kind of glad that God didn't give you everything you asked for? Like, let me ask you a question. Whom would you be married to? <laughs> let's, uh, let's be real. God, I know she isn't a Christian, but she's super cute. Can you make her the one? Do you think you would have survived that hot rod when you were 16 that you're still angry at God about not giving you? Take it from me who by the age of 21 had been through about a dozen cars. Five years, a dozen cars. I was great at driving. Great, okay? Be glad he said no. Jesus says the reason none of that stuff matters is because before you even get to God, he already knows what you are asking for, what you need, and whether or not he's going to say yes or no. God is going to give you, get this, God is going to give you some things before you ask him for them. God is going to say no to some things that you're begging him for, and he's going to provide things that you forget to ask him for. And when you hear all that, what is everybody's gut level response? Why pray? Why? I mean, come on, God, if you already know, what's the, what's the point? And the reason we ask this question honestly, and I feel, is because we don't understand prayer. And I feel that, th that this whole passage is about, that, that this is what the whole passage is about. Jesus wants to set something straight when it comes to this issue around prayer. And the reason we don't understand is that we think prayer is about informing God. It isn't about convincing God to say yes. It isn't about becoming more sovereign than the sovereign God to get him to bend to our will. Prayer isn't about changing God. Prayer is about changing us. And Jesus is going to get that to the second. Prayer is about drawing near to God. And cl the closer and closer that we draw, the more and more we change. Right, because God never changes. That's what the Bible teaches us. He's the same today, forever, and for just he's there. So as we draw nearer to God, the more and more we start to reflect God in our lives. That as we draw closer to God, the more our will starts to line up and sync with God's will. 
That is why we pray, because it's about drawing near. It's not about getting things or, or, or getting things done. It's not about changing the person you're married to. Thank you for making my point already, Lucinda. It's about drawing near and not about having your circumstances rearranged to meet your expectations. So everything that Jesus has taught us up to now was to point to the fact that prayer isn't about you doing something to convince God or coerce God into answering your prayers the way we want them answered in the time that we want them answered. No, Jesus is setting the stage to point to the fact that prayer is actually a, a practice that we all need to do to draw near to God. And then after that, Jesus goes into what we call the Lord's Prayer. All right? And, and, and do, do with it, like, the Lord's Prayer. Right? And, to, and, and then what, went, what, what we end up doing as people is we end up doing the very thing with the Lord's Prayer that Jesus just told us not to do. Let's be real. Like we start to use it as some kind of ritualistic pattern that we somehow think is going to just get everything we want. And we forget that right before he gave us this prayer, he just told us not to do any of that. Now the last thing I want to point out as we get ready to look at the Lord's Prayer is this point right here. Is that prayer is an opportunity to express submission to God's will and dependence on his provision. Submission to God's will and dependence on his provision. And this is what Jesus is teaching the people that are listening. That prayer is this amazing opportunity to express these two things, our submission to God's will and our dependence on his provision. And maybe some of you here, like me, are really good at the dependence on his provision part. But I just don't want to submit to God's will. Because at the end of the day, prayer is about sinking our hearts to the heartbeat of God's will. And Jesus continues, verse 9, Then this then, this then is how you should pray. And the word then here is super important. Super important because the word then is pointing back to all the things Jesus just taught us. This then, that we are to pray, that we are to pray in private, that, it, that we don't need to get hung up on the words, that we need to pray and understand that God Almighty already knows what we need and has already determined the answer. In light of all that, this is how you should pray. Our Heavenly Father, who hallowed be thy name, God, Jesus, Father, this isn't about me. This is not about me. This is all about you. Connecting with God relationally, worshiping the name of Jesus, a God. You are my provider. You are my banner of victory. You are my peace. You are my healer. You are my righteousness. In fact, God, one of your names is you are there. Where's there? Everywhere. Your kingdom come. Now I have a kingdom. You have a kingdom. And those kingdoms have needs and they have wants. But before I talk about my kingdom, God, I'm going to talk about your kingdom come. Your will be done. And here's the hard part on earth as it is in heaven. You want to know why that's hard? In other words, the on earth as it is in heaven is in my life. Your will be done in my life, in my finances, with my wife, with my kids, with my job, with my future, with my health, with my hopes and dreams. I want your will to be done on this earth as consistently as it is done in heaven. And I think we blow by this way too fast because we've turned it into a formula. It's the right words. 
But Jesus' point wasn't to memorize a formula. It was that every day when you are alone in a quiet place praying to the unseen Father, words that nobody else is going to hear, before you ask what you expect, before, uh, before, because after all, God already knows what you need. God can provide you with whatever he wants to provide you with. But you know what God's will? You know what God's will, what God will not do? You know what God will not do? God will not force you to surrender your will to his will. Because God has made you free. And the most honoring thing that I feel is about prayer is that when I come to God as a free individual with my own free will, that God has created me and said, I chose to come to you. And we say, I choose because you've given me free will. But even with that, God, I choose to surrender my free will to yours. That is the honoring thing about prayer. Not the length, not the words, not the repetition, not the volume. It's I come to surrender. And you can use whatever words you want to to do that. Because we all have different words for what surrender means. Then Jesus gets to the second part. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give. Give. Give, 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 give. This is the part we like the best. Right? This is the part where we like to start off with. Give. Give, 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 give. Forgive us today our daily bread. And forgive us. Definitely need some of that. We definitely need some forgiveness. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And here's the really interesting thing. Jesus just ends the prayer. Jesus doesn't say amen. Like the whole your kingdom part doesn't actually show up in any manuscripts until like 300 years after Jesus. If you don't believe me, there's a thing called Google. You can research it. That is not how Jesus ended the prayer. That somewhere along the line, that part was added. And you want to know why I feel Jesus didn't say it? Because Jesus' point was that it it wasn't saying pray like this. Jesus' point was like, I want you to pray. I want you to pray in private. I don't care the words that you use. Besides that, I already know what you're going to say. And when you come to me, I want you to come to me with two things in mind. I want, to, I want you to surrender your will. That is, that, that is, I want you to say, whatever you want in my life, in whatever area of my life, God, I surrender it to you. Whatever or however you need to say that, that is what the Father is listening for. And I want to express dependence on his provision. The ultimately that everything I need comes from the Father anyways. Reminds me of that old song. This is the air I breathe. Who gives you the air? And then Jesus was like, that's it. That's it. And if I was a betting man, all those listening around him and that he was talking to and teaching there, he was like, they were probably thinking, well, that can't be it. There's no way. And Jesus, knowing the heart of man, he's like, well, no, that's it that I recognize you as lordship in my life and I recognize that I am dependent on you for everything. And some of the longest prayers that I have personally ever prayed don't center around give me stuff. You want to know what it centers around? Your will be done. The surrender part. And if you will... If you will pray, if you will pray, even if your will is not surrendered, God will wrestle you to the ground if you continue to pray. Let me give you a short example. I used to be a smoker seven years ago, eight years ago. I lost count. doesn't matter. But I used to be a smoker. I picked it up when I was in the military um, because in Iraq I could get cartons of cigarettes for $5. And there was nothing else to do horrible reasons, but that's where I picked it up, right? Anyway, so I used to smack, uh, uh, smack, <laughs> I used to smoke, <laughs> lighten up the tension a little bit, I used to, 
<laughs> I used to smoke. I was a smoker. I smoked about a pack a day. And um, it, it's a costly habit. But I tried everything. And you guys have probably heard this story. I tried everything. I tried, I tried the gum. I didn't like eating chalkboards. Um, I tried the patch. It didn't stick because I sweat too much, uh, because I stand still all the time, right? Um, I, I, I tried prescriptions. I tried, I, I tried everything that man could prescribe to fix the fact that I smoke cigarettes. And then one day, Pastor Justin asked me and my wife to take a youth group to a youth camp so they could go to a grow conference. And I smoked my last cigarette on the way to the church to pick up the kids to go to the youth conference. Because at the, at the conference, and this is another revelation that I had during this, preparing for this, which is why this message was so important to me, okay? Because it wasn't until I surrendered my will about smoking to his will about me not smoking was I set free from it. I had my will. My will was, I want to because I can. And I don't care what anybody says about it, including you, God. Now what? But I knew that wasn't God's will for my life because smoking kills you. Why would God want you to do something that kills you? And it wasn't until I surrendered my will on my face at a youth camp that I, wasn't, I was a leader for to his will was I completely set free from smoking. And if you will make it a habit in your life to pray, and if you will make it a habit in your life to, to pray alone, and you will make it a habit to not get hung up on the words and the formulas, and if you will come to a time of prayer with the understanding that God already knows, and he's already made up his mind because that's not what it's about, and if you will come to that time of prayer saying, I am here for two things, God, to surrender my will to your will, and to express my dependency on your provision. Give me this day, this daily bread. It comes from you. That as you start to draw near to God, that way Jesus has invited us to, when you start to draw near to God, the, the way that Jesus has invited us to, something will start to, be, to happen inside of you. As your heavenly Father starts to change your will, as you submit to his, as you continue to surrender your will, you will start to realize your dependency on his provision. That is how Jesus wants us to pray. Now, really quick, really quick, um, I want to give you some practical stuff for all of you, all the different versions, and I'm going to do this as quickly as I possible. If you have questions afterwards, you didn't get what I said, just come get with me, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, Tr traditionalist, if you're a traditionalist, let me say this, be careful. Because you probably have some prayers that you love to pray and that, that, that are great as long as you keep them sincere and your heart is right with them. But please don't hide behind your prayer so that you can dodge the thy will be done bullet. Maybe that is for all of us, not just the traditionalists. I don't know. Because Jesus told us that God isn't impressed by that. God has invited us into a time of prayer to surrender our will and declare our dependence upon his provision. Okay? Careful. Okay? Naturalist, guess where your private time should probably be? Outside. I want you to literally go take a hike. <laughs> go take a hike. Take a walk. Go for one. Whatever it is, do it outside. Because you look, you, you, you look, if you locked yourself in a closet, you won't be able to express your, your love for God as well as you would be if you were outside in the nature that you love to see God in. Okay? Intellectuals. Intellectuals. You need to pray out loud. You need to pray out loud. And, and you know why you need to pray out loud? Because to you, Christianity is all in the mind. And because it's so easy for you to just blow out a prayer in your mind and because you're in a hurry, because you just spent three hours in the Word and you got all these amazing things, but it's all in your head and you get in a hurry, you just blow through a prayer. Right? And it's okay because, well, you just spent, and you think it's okay because you just spent two hours, three hours in the Word, right? And the reason that I want you to pray out loud is that this will force you to do two things. It'll force you to slow down and it will start to move prayer from a mind thing 
to a heart thing. Got it, intellectuals? Contemplatives. Some of you might already do this, but write your prayers down. All right? This is very helpful for, you, for contemplatives because you can go back and see all the things that God has done in your life as he answers those prayers. Okay? Aesthetics. Aesthetics, those who like to be quiet and be alone. You've got to have a spot. A spot. Singular, no more. A, that's where I'm going. You cannot continue to go from spot to spot to spot Right, because it, and that spot could be a chair, it could be a room, it might even be a closet. But if you connect with God through aloneness, then you've got to discipline yourself to find that place where you can be alone with God. And it needs to be a place that you're familiar with because it's a consistent, it's a discipline. You're going to the same place over and over again. Okay, activist, you've got you you have to find a quiet place occasionally, right? You need to concentrate on the thy will be done because your tendency is that God's thy will be done out there in the world because you want to change the world and you want to see all these amazing things happen. And when, you're, when your tendency should really be, God, thy will be done in my life, in my heart first before I go out there and try to change the world. Okay? Caregivers, caregivers, you need to focus on thy will be done through me. Right? Here's where caregivers get tripped up because you, you are so concerned with all the spiritual and physical needs of those around you that your temptation will be to meet everybody or try to meet everybody's needs. And God hasn't called you to meet everybody's needs. So your prayer might, your prayer might not just sound like this. God, I want your will to be done for those around me. But, I, but God, give me specific direction. Thy will be done through me to others, but I'm trusting you to lead me to the one and two, not to the tens and twenties. Enthusiast, IR1, okay? You love to worship and you love to be loud. Get out. And if you aren't careful, if we aren't careful, because I, I'm, a, I'm an enthusiast, we will substitute our time in public worship with our time in private worship. And you've got to get alone. We have got to get alone. But I don't like to be alone. I like to be loud and in a crowd. God has made it clear that he wants us to pray privately. And I believe God is saying, if you will give me the alone time, I will reward you in your public worship times. Okay? we got to get alone, enthusiast. Sensates. Sensates. Those who... Worship and express through senses, senses, taste, touch, feel, all those fun things, seeing. You need to pray out loud because you can hear it. And here's a key for sensates. Unlike the aesthetics, change your environment often. Be alone, but don't be alone in the same place all the time because that will drive you crazy because it looks the same every time. You need different sounds. You need different smells to help you connect with God. So don't change what you're doing, just where you might do it, okay? And I always say to everyone that says that prayer time is just kind of blah, like if that's what your thought, like my prayer time is just kind of blah, you need to change the routine. Change it, change it, change it. Find something different. If you're praying quietly, pray out loud. If you're praying out loud, write it down. Change the routine, get something to make it fresh and new so that you're experiencing it differently, okay? And I want to close this whole thing out with a question. Imagine what, the, what would happen if every Christian would pray like this. More of a statement, I guess. That, that every Christian would actually pray. That every Christian would would. would pray in private. There is a public aspect because James does tell us to come to one another and pray so that there may be healing. So there's a public aspect of praying. I'm not speaking against all public praying, okay? Understand that. And realize that the words, that, that Christians would realize that the words and the length aren't as important as the heart behind them. And understand that God already knew, already knows what you're about to say. And he already knows whether he's going to answer. And that you would say, even though you already know what I'm asking for. You already know what I need, God. Thy will be done in me. 
And where I don't want my, thy will to be done in me, God, keep the pressure on me so that every moment when I come to this place of private prayer with you, that you will finally break my will so that I can draw closer to you and people will experience more of you and me. And that that would leave, that, that, that we would leave the quiet place with the realization that everything that you need and ever will need, as Brent has said multiple times, every good thing comes from your father because he is a good, good father. And I want, and I want, I want, I'm going to leave this day with these two things in your mind. Surrender and dependence, surrender and dependence, surrender and dependence. That when you come to Jesus, when you come to that private place, when you come to prayer, that God wants you to surrender your will. And it's okay to tell God, God, I don't want to surrender my will. I don't want to. I don't want to give you my marriage. I don't want to give you my job. I don't want to give you my finances. I want my will and my money. I like my money. But can you see why Jesus was like, let's cut through all of that stuff and let's get to the heart of the Father and what he really wants. So he invites us to draw near to him through prayer. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that your word never comes back void. That when you said that, that we are to pray, and that we are to pray privately, and it doesn't matter about the rhetoric, because I already know what you need, because at the end of the day, your prayer time is about surrendering your will to me so that I can change you and the world can see me. It's not about you. Our Father, connecting with you relationship, you are a heavenly Father. You are a good Good Father, you loved us so much. You sent Jesus to die for us, not to condemn us, not to condemn us, to save us. And we thank you this morning that we get to draw near to you through choosing. It's a choice, it's choosing. My will be like your will. I want your will done in our lives as consistently as it is done in heaven. And we thank you and we glorify your name. And we ask that the Holy Spirit just point out those places where our wills are not surrendered. Whether it's relationships, whether it's finances, whether it's, whether it's our relationship with you, our will with you is at, like, whatever it might be, wherever those conflicts of wills are, that you help us wrestle it to the ground and you point it out that your will be done. Your will be done. Thy will be done. Not John's. You are in charge of New Day Church, and I want your will done for New Day Church. I don't want John to have anything to do with it. So give us the wisdom. Give us the understanding. Point out those areas of our lives where we're not surrendered to your will. As we go forward to, to, to be, be changed internally, to be more like you, the reflection of Jesus. And we ask all of these things in the most precious, most powerful name of Jesus. Amen.